metaphors that were used by Shakespeare's contemporaries to talk about how beautiful and wonderful their um, love was. Okay, and he's saying like, no, actually, she's a real woman. Okay. <laughs> If she really had um, snow white skin, we'd be afraid she was dead or had leprosy, right? Um, <laughs> OK. Um, and yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. OK? So I think my love is as beautiful as any woman who gets lied about with these false comparisons, OK? So that's the twist, right? She's normal. She's a human being. And by the way, she's at least as beautiful as those other ones that um, people wrote all those uh, fakey metaphors about. So up till this point, we're just, dis just proving that she's human. And the last two lines are, yeah, and that's good. <laughs> all right. Um, so here, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves hath all too short a date. So summer's lease is going to end too soon. OK, it has a sh too short an end date. Um, Sometime too hot the eye of heaven, sh heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair, everything fair, from fair sometime declines. It's not always fair, OK, uh, by chance or nature's changing course, undecorated, untrimmed, OK? But thy eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest. Okay. So here we have actually two couplets, each of which has a slightly different um, part of saying, OK, summer isn't a good enough metaphor because summer is temporary and variable. It isn't, I, I, you're not just a summer's day. I need a better metaphor for you than a summer's day, because summer's days sometimes are not beautiful. Sometimes they're unpleasant, um, are certainly too short. Um, <laughs> OK? Um, and then here, right? But that won't happen to you, right? You, your beauty and wonderfulness isn't variable and isn't short-lived, OK? Why? OK, we're now wondering why. And the reason is given, so long as men can breathe, their eyes can see, so long lives this. That is the sonnet, OK? And this gives life to thee. OK, so here we are. We're reading it right now. Um, Shakespeare didn't lie. <laughs> OK, um, and here, perhaps even more fun, all right, that time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as on the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed by that which it was nourished by. Sorry, that's a typo. OK, so when a fire dies down, it's consumed by the ashes of the wood which originally nourished it. OK. Um, so these are three different metaphors for old age, right? So old age is autumn turning into winter. Um, old age is twilight turning into night. And old age is a fire that burned bright, now dying down. OK, so all of these are um, light heat cycles that are limited. Um, and our final inference that we should draw from every one of these, but isn't this obvious? I mean, like, should I necessarily draw this from each of the source domains? I need it maybe from the target domain, right? Um, this thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well, which thou must love, leave ere long. So the fact that I'm mortal should make you love me more. OK. Um, is that necessarily the case with a fire that's dying, right? We're not, when the, it's not the case that every time we, uh, see twilight or see an actual fire die, we're necessarily impelled to think the fire was more wonderful or the day was more wonderful necessarily um, because it's almost over, right? But um, a person, on the other hand, who's going to um, go away, right? Here comes something from the uh, target domain. You're more upset and you value them even more because you're afraid of losing them. OK. Um, all right, and then um, my final favorite example. 
OK, so this is um, nine and a half lines from Macbeth. Um, a very, very famous nine and a half lines. And as we'll see, it's got like almost that many metaphors in it. Um, so tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. OK, very, very famous lines. Um, and in less than 10 lines here, we have uh, time is movement through space, right? It creeps in petty pace from day to day and so on. Time is a linguistic text, the last syllable of recorded time. Um, life is a cycle of light and heat. Um, lighted the way to dusty death and out, out, brief candle. Um, life is a journey. It, it, how, the fools are going to dusty death into an underground location, an unpleasant underground location. Life is a moving shadow, either a ghost or maybe the man in the cave metaphor. Right? That's all you get for life is uh, watching those shadows from the cave, possibly. Um, life is a player or a play, maybe. Um, player and stage. Life is a story, the tale told by an idiot. Uh, there they all are. Um, are there too many of these metaphors packed into this nine and a half lines for individual ones to be salient? I think um, the answer both of people who've heard this speech and love it and also of uh, like looking at how these things have been used is clearly not the case. So um, Robert Frost has a poem entitled Out, Out, Brief Candle, um, Faulkner's novel The Sound and the Fury. Um, Aldous Huxley wrote a famous essay called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow about um, imagining the future, um, which resulted in a bunch of science fiction anthologies called either Tomorrow and Tomorrow or Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Um, and there is a history of science fiction fandom called All Our Yesterdays. Um, <laughs> so obviously, people were not failing to notice individual metaphors out of this bunch just because there were so many of them packed in. One would never um, advise a young novice author to attempt this kind of uh, combination of metaphors. Right? You'd be afraid that he'd be or she'd be mixing metaphors um, and accused of complete incoherence. Right? Um, but the reverse is true in this case, thanks to Shakespeare, who was uh, completely in control of what he was doing. Um, it's not. Um, so. We have this effect that we notice, which is that Macbeth seems to be completely trapped in this scenario. We feel with him this feeling of uh, no exit. Um, and I point you to Donald Freeman's work on path metaphors in Macbeth if you want to like, uh, think about that some more. But the reader or listener, I think, shares not only Macbeth's despair, but this feeling of being trapped. Okay. So actually, there's um, relatively little generic structure that's shared by all the domains involved in all of these metaphors. If you were to try to find generic structure, maybe limited time span activities and situations might be a generic space that covers uh, stories, light, he heat, cycles, um, life, <laughs> right, and so on. Covers everything. Um, in some of the individual metaphors, there's more shared between the two domains map. But with a, for, between all of them in this, in this nine and a half lines, there's only about that much shared. Um, but what's in common between the metaphors is that the original mapping, the conventional mapping, does not provide a reason to give up on life while you're still alive. OK, so life's a play, a linguistic text, a story. So enjoy it, or make it meaningful, or whatever. Uh, life's a brief light heat cycle. Well, make the most of it, right? Um, life's a journey. Uh, go somewhere good. Um, choose the right path. Macbeth has already chosen the wrong path. He is so far um, gone in blood that tour is tedious <laughs> to return. Um, OK. Uh, OK. Um, but in each case, Shakespeare has altered the source domain so that the inferences are despairing instead. So it's a journey. 
but it's a creeping, tedious journey that only leads to one place, dusty death. Um, it's a play, but it's a terrible, incoherent, meaningless play. Um, it's a message or a story, but the story is melodramatic um, and meaningless, OK? Um, incoherent, maybe. All right. Um, it's a light heat cycle, but it's so short that it's worthless. We might as well blow out the candle ourselves because the, the cycle is so short, it's, no, it's no, not worth having. So in each case, the transferred inference from Shakespeare's newly altered source domains, where he added structure to each source domain, um, is that life is not worth living, where the conventional mappings would have suggested that it probably could be. It right? doesn't say it has to be, but it, it could be. All right. Um, so what's the larger blending structure here? And Karin and I um, spent some time thinking about this. Um, so one possible way to think about it would be a huge multi-space blend in at least three dimensions. Um, and maybe that's even the right solution. But another way to think about it is um, possibly successive blends with each one shaping the input to the next. So suppose I say life is a slow, tedious journey to only a negative destination. The grave, I get these inferences. It's tedious, unpleasant. One can't hope for it to get better. It inevitably ends, which therefore may be a good thing, in fact. Um, now I say life is a short cycle of light and heat. So as well as being tedious, unpleasant, et cetera, which I know from up here, right? Um, it's so short that it's no use. You may as well end it now. Okay. Notice the fascinating character of subjective time here, which is slow, tedious, and too short. Okay. Um, life is a play or a player. Um, Shakespeare uses this metaphor very frequently um, in other plays, but usually much more cheerfully than this. Um, so it's a, but it's a bad melodramatic um, player whom nobody calls back, right? He struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is seen no more, right? He's not going to be called back for a bow or another performance, that's for sure. Um, so as well as being tedious, unpleasant, doomed to end in death and uselessly short, life is meaningless and aesthetically lacking, OK? It has no beauty or meaning, maybe lacking in moral genuineness, although it's dramatic, right? It's a, poor player that struts and frets, he's fakey. Um, and life is not very morally genuine, although dramatic. Like lots of things happen, like injury, death, um, human qu quote drama, but none of it's meaningful. Okay. Um, life is a story, an incoherent, emotional, dramatic, meaningless one. So as well as being tedious, unpleasant, doomed to end in death, uselessly short, meaningless, aesthetically lacking, and dramatic, it's specifically incoherent, lacking in narrative unity. Okay? And since um, they, the Elizabethans, as well as we, um, saw life as a story, um, that's a perfectly um, reasonable inference. It's a conventional metaphor. OK, um, so as I said, one wouldn't recommend this particular um, blending strategy to a novice. It has, however, impressive power to express exactly the kind of meaning that Shakespeare wanted to bring to us in this particular context. Um, it's not a conventional poetic blending strategy, but it takes some of those conventional strategies and even some conventional metaphors and uses them in a new, larger, complex structure. And I would say Shakespeare had to have like full mastery of a bunch of these other strategies. Now, he is, in this piece of work anyway, very much a maximalist, which is kind of odd. Um, we look at Lear and we might say maybe he's being a minimalist sometimes there too. Shakespeare's kind of everything, I guess. But this speech is very much maximalist. It's full of rich imagery, lots and lots of stuff crammed in. Um, and so a large part of what we mean by poetic style here seems to be what kinds of blending patterns are preferred or performed. And this, it seems to me, could be extended to prose rhetoric and narrative structure and think about the uh, blending patterns involved in those in similar kinds of ways. Um, OK, so and finally, this is an inferential cage for Macbeth. OK, this is why we feel so trapped. So people go on living for a lot of different kinds of reasons. And I, I list some reasons here which are related to the, to the um, scenarios that are actually brought up by the metaphors. Right? They're currently happy, or life is pleasant. 
They hope for a better future. They hope for a better future after death. But actually, of course, I'm not here because the life ends with the grave. There's no mention of an afterlife in this. Um, they hope to achieve some goals with the time left. Sorry, Macbeth already achieved too many goals. His problem is he did too much, and he can't undo it, um, and so on, right? Um, but this speech pretty much takes out in nine and a half lines, right, all of the major conventional reasons that one might want to go on living. Each new metaphor's inferences about life take away more possible reasons for hope or for keeping on living. Um, so and indeed, for Macbeth, it's too late. Okay? There is no way to change his things. His life is not going to become worth living. And the only, so we know the only solution is death, and that's what's going to happen. So in these 10 lines, the reader feels Macbeth like desperately looking for a metaphor that'll give him less dreadful inferences. Right? And the irony is, conventionally, all these metaphors give perfectly OK inferences. There's nothing wrong with them. But he's so despairing that in each case, he fills in the stuff in the source domain that makes the uh, target domain turn out impossible. Right? Creates, dis creates despair, because that's how he is. So um, unlike us most of the time, who can think of competing metaphor construals of our situation with different inferences, right? And say, oh gosh, maybe if I think about it this way, I'll get a different inference about what I should do. Um, Macbeth can't. He's stuck with this buildup of coherent and worsening inferences. And that's what we're feeling when we're feeling caught in this uh, inferential cage, which is also a stylistic um, tour de force of blending. And I think that's it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it looks. <laughs> and I refer all questions to my co-author, who I'm sure can handle it to these <laughs> entirely. <laughs> but jump in, jump in, please. Yeah. Let's see. I saw that hand first, and then that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I just like to say a little bit about the a frost poem. Uh, I think a, a, there's there are some lines in there that might make it seem a little less trite. <laughs> um, in the poem, he says that the other scene is no less worn and seems just as good. So in fact, there's a contradiction between the next to last line, I took the one last traveled by, and the, and the middle part of the poem. In fact, there is no road. Less traveled by, OK, by. OK. OK, so, so there's a contradiction in the poem, and you have to work that out. OK, OK. And, and Normally, the normal reading of the poem is one that simply ignores the middle part. OK, OK. Sorry. No, no, sorry. No, no, I, the, the thing about this poem is that it was actually written for a very private purpose. Frost used to go for walks in England with a friend of his who would always dither about which path to take. And they would come back, and he would start complaining, oh, we should have gone the other way. So Frost wrote this poem <laughs> to tease the guy, to make fun of him. Uh, okay. Say, what a big choice you made. It doesn't make any difference <laughs> at all. That's the conclusion of the poem. <laughs> very good, very good. I should point out, by the way, that um, authors don't have only one mode of this kind of structure. Um, and Dickinson, for example, was in her lifetime mostly published as a more conventional Victorian woman poet. And so those poems are actually often way more closed and not as open in, in structure. And a lot of her more um, difficult meanings that were more problematic for her contemporaries are um, kept in the more open poems where nobody can accuse her of having said something specific. Um, so there's reasons and reasons for an open style. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about intertextuality as a kind of metaphor here. Intertextuality is blending, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've said so about Cyrano once upon a time, yeah. yes. Yeah. So you said uh, that you took the less trodden path, and, and that seems to me to take the poem, and walking in England makes it very interesting. 
she dwelt among the untrodden ways beside the springs of Dove, and, and that ends with, and that has made all the difference. Um, and the difference to me in that words were. That's right, that's right. And so if they're walking in the Lake District, that would be another set of illusions. And so that would be, you know, if you had this list of different kinds of metaphors, image metaphors, that's right, metaphors, that's right. ritual metaphors, scientific analogy, personification, we can add intertextuality to this list and many more. Okay, not all intertextuality is metaphoric. So um, when in the last act of Cyrano, okay, um, there's all these lines from previous acts, okay, and they mean something different in the new context, and that's what intertextuality is, right? Something doesn't lose its old context, it brings it with it and meshes it with the new one. So when Cyrano pretends to read his own letter from 15 years ago to Roxanne, right? And she gradually figures out that he's not reading it, so she gradually realizes that he knows it by heart and therefore that he wrote it. Okay. Um, there's one, he, one part of her is hearing Christian saying goodbye to her 14 years before. Um, the imagined Christian, who was a wonderful poet as well as um, a brave and faithful lover, right? Another so part of Cyrano is seeing the blended lover that he made for Roxanne saying goodbye to her. Part of him is seeing his own young 25-year-old self thinking he was going to die writing this letter in the voice of Christian back when. And part of him is at age 40 saying goodbye to a woman that he's never yet told he loves and is still only telling that he loves via this blend. Okay. Now, it's the same words, and there's no metaphoric structure here. The intertextuality lies in the fact that there's all these different contexts that the lines come from, and that the contexts are blended so that we have multiple scenarios simultaneously evoked. So I don't want to say all intertextuality is uh, metaphor. Intertextuality is definitely blending. Right. Yeah, OK, OK, but please. Although yeah. there's a perception of similarity, too, in, in very many cases that, that grounds that uh, intertextuality. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so you've got all these different kinds of, of metaphors. Um, is the argument then that conceptual blending gives us the right terminology to discuss all of these different kinds of metaphors? That's right. It's, I hope that, that, um, that um, although we can't say that they all have the same, exactly the same mapping properties. Right. And one of the things people haven't attended to, I don't think, although I'm really glad that Carol has been bringing this up and she's been telling us for a long time we need to think about it, is sort of the construction of this stuff. How does a metaphor get built up? What do I have? What do I have to build myself? What's given? What's new? Um, and so on. And what does that change about the meaning, right? Um, and I could decide that, for example, I really think that the Strawberries poem for me is about female authorship or something, right? Um, but the fact that I came to that conclusion on my own and Dickinson didn't um, hand it to me, right? It still makes a difference as to the cognitive uh, processing that went that went on. So I think, and I, that just hasn't been attended to enough. And then there are all these cases where something isn't entirely metaphoric, or you don't necessarily want to call it um, metaphor. And there, there's the fact that these metaphor things are so different. They can all be talked about as blending, but they don't all have the same structure. An image metaphor has no inferential transfer necessarily, right? So yeah, I'm arguing for, um, as Gilles was actually, um, <laughs> a plurality of entities here, which there's reasons, convenient reasons for some purposes to cl still class as metaphor. I don't think the term is entirely useless, but I think it really obscures the heterogeneity. I've got time for about one more question. Uh, Carol. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about the alternative space that's created perhaps by going against the uh, conventional mapping in the Shakespeare sonnet and in the Macbeth soliloquy that um, in a sense, you're actually almost drawing on creating this alternative you could space that has the conventional mapping right. in it and playing that's right. against that's it. That's right. And you could say actually that the that that um that Macbeth thing I didn't I, I, boy, I didn't want to talk about intertextuality today, but now I've talked about Cyrano. All right, right. Um, <laughs> that it's massively intertextual right. with hundreds, thousands of Renaissance poems about uh, that time of year. Thou mayst in me behold, right. um, and Shakespeare's own. Um, 
often rather cheerful understanding of life's a play, um, which we find frequently, and so on, right? All of those things. Um, and, and other people's work of the same period, right? So yeah, I could say it's a, it's a huge intertextual um, blend as well, yeah. And somehow, um, it all says the opposite thing. Thanks very much. See you in the morning. Stand up. Stand up, Martin. <laughs>